If you would, um, today our text, rather lengthy text, we're going to be in Acts chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, and we are going to go through chapter 26 and verse 11. And we will read there in a moment. Um, We're rapidly bringing the book of Acts to a close. Uh, We've just got a handful of chapters left to go. And uh, it has flown by. And as we were talking about kind of, okay, well, what are we going to do next? You know, and um, the things that have been decided on to kind of close out the year, we we will put Acts to bed next month. We will finish Acts and we will move on to a to something else, and then next year, uh, Pastor Tim has got it laid out for what we are going to do, and I'm really excited about this. Um, but he did say that this is all contingent on if I come back, how much do I have to clean up? And I said, well, funny you should say that. We thought we would take these few weeks and maybe clean a few things up for you. In all seriousness, y'all can take comfort that the three of us agree on the essentials. We are immovable uh, on what is essential. Do we have our differences? We do. And that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. Um, At the beginning of this month, we got to take the students to the beach, and that was a great trip. And and I was uh, talking to Joe this morning Really, one of the parts of the trip that I was most concerned about is I'm not a big fan of long trips and driving, but we split the driving responsibilities of the church van and and taking the students down there. And we spent a total of about 10 hours in a van together, and we talked about the Bible all 10 hours. And it was wonderful for me. He challenged me. My brother challenged me on what I believe, and I hope that I did the same with him. So that is the kind of thing that we seek to do as believers, that iron, iron sharpening iron aspect. The nature of iron sharpening iron is it's, it can be abrasive, but it is meant to refine and to sharpen both involved. And this is a good thing. It is, uh, I would say, as we um, look at the teachings of the apostle Paul, He had these people in his lives that were refreshing to him. Was he led by the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But he needed his brothers along the way. He had a long journey um, and ministry to the nations. So a bit of a kind of an introduction. One of the challenges for me here, I really enjoy history, but when it comes to kind of uh, uh, being able to preach a sermon on the historical narrative, there's really um, not any new doctrine taught. There's not doctrine taught in the the lengthy passage we're going to take a look at today. And in fact, beginning back a few weeks ago when we got to chapter 21 and Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, there's no doctrine taught really from that point to the end of the book. We're just seeing the history Holy Spirit inspired history that Luke wrote down for us of what happened as Paul's third missionary journey and his ministry comes to an end. So a few things that I uh, kind of pulled from this and while there's no new doctrine taught, I think there is ample principles taught in the life of Paul in these, these histories that we read about. When we come to scripture, one of the things that I like to ask is, this is historical narrative, so we interpret it as such. We can rest assured because it is Holy Spirit inspired that this is 100% true history. These people actually lived and these things actually happened to them. But in all of human history, why does God tell us these stories? Paul had a, his entire ministry encompassed nearly 30 years. Why did the Holy Spirit tell us these particular stories? Also, would like you to be mindful 
of the parallels in this story, really in beginning in, in 21, it's, it's a series um, of Paul going through the same kind of things over and over again. And the parallels and the similarities to what happened to Jesus as he was betrayed and arrested and, and he was taken before foreign rulers and judges to be tried on false charges and he was ultimately crucified. And it's, it's some very striking similarities to what Paul goes through. He is falsely accused. He has been falsely accused for a while now. These charges have no basis, but that does not matter to them. So if you would, we'll go ahead and um, begin and read this link, uh, lengthy section this morning, beginning in chapter 25, verse 1. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea, and the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. And they urged him, at, asking as a favor against Paul that he summon him to Jerusalem because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So he said, let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the, Jew, the law of the Jews nor against the temple nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, which, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there's nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his, with his counsel, answered, to Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had a certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came up with great pomp and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in and Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death and as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write my Lord about him. Therefore, I've brought him before you all and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner 
not to indicate the charge against him. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa. I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem, not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would guide us this morning through your word. Help us to see your sovereign hand working in and through the circumstances that the Apostle Paul finds himself. Let Paul be an example to us as we face a world that hates the gospel message of Jesus. Let Paul's joy and passion become our joy and passion as we confidently bring the life-saving gospel to a dying world. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So last week we left off, and Pastor Drew made a point that uh, we are introduced to a new person called Portius Festus. He is replacing Felix as the procurator of Judea for the Roman Empire. Portius Festus was from a noble family in Rome. Felix was an evil and greedy man, and Festus was a wise and honorable man. Now, I don't want to um, indicate that Festus is a moral man, but when it comes to comparison to Felix, he is more of the aristocrat type. He's a noble man as far as Roman custom go. Felix was evil. He was a maniac. He is very likely, is just as likely to have kept Paul in prison. He's just as likely to have had him executed because that was what the Jews desired. If you remember, the Jews had made an oath that they would not eat until Paul was dead, until they had killed him. When we read the scripture, chapter 24 ends and chapter 25 begins, but two years have passed. Two years have passed. Paul has been kept in prison. He was kept in a, um, um, it was probably the residence of the Roman procurator, which would at this time be Festus now. It would have likely been Herod's palace that was taken over. So this was not a prison, horrible prison sentence, but he was, he was not free to go. He was in chains. But, but two years passed. A lot happens in two years. A lot can happen in two years. I want us to see God's providence in these things. So according to history... Festus was the Roman procurator in Judea from 59 AD to 62 AD. So that gives us an idea of the time frame we're dealing with here with the Apostle Paul. And two years have passed, and the first thing the Jews do when Festus arrives is they bring up Paul. 
We want him dead. What kind of hate must you have for someone that two years passed and it has not left your mind? You want the man dead. It's a blind hatred. What fuels a hatred like this? Though we can never know, I, I thought as studying this about those that two years prior had made an oath that they wouldn't eat until Paul was dead. In our day, <clears throat> well, that's, we're not going to, that's no big deal. I, I, I can't, with, he's in prison, we can't do anything about it. In their day, they took their oaths seriously. They were fanatical about these things. They probably died of starvation because Paul was locked up and they couldn't get to him. When they make an oath that they will not eat until Paul's dead, and two years have passed, you can't go two years without eating. It's conjecture, but I, you know, think about these things as we read. It's to not fly over them, so to speak, but there is a hatred that is driven by the Jews. It's a very similar hatred to the Jews' hatred of Jesus many years prior. And they still planned to ambush. That's why they wanted to take him back to Jerusalem. He's kept in Caesarea. It's a few miles, you know, it's, it's not too far north of Jerusalem, the area of Caesarea. It wouldn't be that hard of a journey to get him brought from there to Jerusalem. But it would be long enough, just long enough for them to do what they desired to do, and that's ambush and kill him. They were not interested in justice. They were interested in silencing him. What drives this? These are ethnic Jews. They are, ethnically speaking, Abraham's children. What drives it? John 15 tells us, if the world hates you, this is Jesus' words, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember that Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. This is what drives their hatred. The world hates us, the world hates Jesus, the world will hate us. There's only two kingdoms, and I use that term loosely, there's only two types of people, those that are in Christ and those that are as Jesus called the Jews of that day, you are of your father, the devil. Those are the two kinds of people we have in this story and in this world still today. And those that are of the enemy, the devil and Satan, they hate Jesus, therefore they will hate us. So as we proceed, and again, we're not because it's such a lengthy passage, there's just so many things that we're gonna um, be able to cover this morning. I want to hit a few high spots and bring out a, a few things and hopefully bring about three points of application for us uh, at the end. One of the things that, that stood out ab about this is I typically use the ESV. I like that translation. But the ESV and the NASB translate the word in verse 6 10 and 17 of chapter 25 is tribunal, is what the ESV uses. The NA, NASB uses the same translation. The LSB and the King James Version translate this more accurately, I believe. This word tribunal is called judgment seat. It is the translated the judgment seat. So these are ungodly people sitting in judgment over God's apostle. There's an irony there, but there's also God's providence working in through this. So they are, sit, they are sitting, sitting in judgment over God's man, of which he's done nothing wrong. Verse seven, it says, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him bringing many and serious charges against them that they could not prove. They can't prove anything. And in verse 9 through 11, Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor. So he asks, 
Paul to see about being brought to Jerusalem. The difference between Paul, I'm, I'm sorry, Festus and Felix, again, Felix was an evil man. He was just as likely to have had him killed by the Jews' request as he was to just keep him locked up. But Festus is more of what we would really even today consider what we would understand as a politician. He did what was politically expedient for him. And one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that Felix had happened under him was Judea was typically a very difficult region for the Roman Empire. There was constant kind of uprisings that had to be constantly put down. It was a volatile region for the Roman Empire it's in this day. And the actions of Felix, Felix had a far longer run as uh, governor there in Judea than Festus, and things were beginning to stir a bit, uprisings, and, and, and uh, you could see the temperature rising of different revolts and rumors of revolts. It was an unsettled time there, which is why they had him brought back to Rome, and he was replaced by this man. Well, Festus is going to do what's, again, politically expedient. He's trying to appease everyone involved. He wants to honor the emperor, but he also wants to appease the Jews because they're the ones stirring up controversy. So you have to understand, the Jews were, they were masters at blackmail and manipulation. These Jews I'm talking about that are falsely accusing Paul, they could not be trusted they could have got their wish and one of them could have had him executed and they were just as likely a few years later to go and report to the emperor that a man had been unjustly executed by your people. They could not be trusted. They were driven by blind hatred. So this is the, the kind of the parties that are involved right here. <clears throat> you see in Festus, God's providence I believe, in that the temperature gets settled down a little bit of what's happening in this region. And he seems to listen. Now, I don't believe he's been convinced, but he's listening to these charges. He says later, I, I, don't, I don't know what they're upset about. They bring these charges, but there's nothing of proof that they offer. All they offer is accusations. They offer no proof. So we get introduced again as if we needed any more unsavory characters. In verse 13, we get introduced to two more. Agrippa and Bernice. Herod Agrippa II, that's who this is. He's the son of Agrippa I, the great-grandson of Herod the Great. So he is one of the Herods. Bernice is the oldest daughter of Agrippa I. A widow twice, a, a woman that is widowed twice before entering into an incestuous relationship with her brother Agrippa II. These are vile people. These are the type of people <laughs> that are trying to sit in judgment on God's man. Now, the interesting thing about Agrippa is he really has no power. He's not much more than a figurehead at this point. There's not much in the way that he can do. He might, because of the title as Herod, and they, they, they call him king. He's no king. He might have a bit of influence, possibly, especially over a man like Festus that looks to be politically expedient and do what's best for him. But these are evil people, and these are the people sitting in judgment on, on God's man. And we've got the Jews bringing charges against Paul that they cannot prove. Well, what does God's law say about this? He's not silent about it. Deuteronomy... Chapter 19 says, concerning bringing a charge, he says, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime 
or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, <clears throat> then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he has had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. That's what God's law says to do to such people. These are his people, ethnically speaking. These are descendants of Abraham, and they, they know the law too. They know it. They know what they're doing, but they're blind by the hatred. Their charges that they wish to bring against Paul cannot be proven, and if they can't prove them under God's law, it is to be done to them. That necessarily will keep you from bringing such a false charge, wouldn't it? If I bring a charge against you and I cannot prove it, so whatever the punishment would have been, I face the same punishment should I not be able to prove it. And I can't do it on my own. I have to have witnesses. So God has set this up. And the irony here is those that sit in judgment will be judged and will face this judgment in a short time period of time. Again, we're talking about 5960 AD. We're only a few years away, a decade or so away from judgment, God's judgment coming upon these people for the things that they have done to his people. Remember, this man, Paul, was one of these. That was part of his, def uh, part of his defense to Agrippa. He says, I was one of these. I was a Pharisee, the strictest sect of our people. I did the same thing. There's a lot of irony here in that these same people, Paul was one of them when it came to Jesus and his people. He stood by and gave approval and held the coats of the men that stoned Stephen. I, I can't help but think, how often do you think he saw Stephen's face and those he persecuted as he's standing in the same place that those that, uh, that went before him, he stood, he was, he was on the other side. He was the accuser of the brethren. And now he, as a brother, is being accused by the same people. Paul had a passion for Christ and the gospel, but he also had a passion for his people that they would come to know the truth and there is a power in that. As Stephen dies back in the beginning of this book in Acts 7, just forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. It seems to have worked. Paul's forgiven and Paul is told by Christ when he saves him, I will show you how much you must suffer for my sake. This is it. This is what Paul's life has been nothing but trial as he preaches and proclaims Christ among the nations among the Gentiles. And just a, an aside, when you read Gentiles translated in our scripture, it's, it's ethnos, it means nations. Paul was God's man sent to the nations. That is fulfilling that promise that God made back to Abraham. In you, the nation, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And that is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is our message today. So as, he, <clears throat> as we move along, chapter 26 opens, or uh, as we uh, are introduced to these unsavory characters, I, I thought of an illustration. It says that, uh, that the next day when, when uh, Agrippa and Bernice are going to sit and hear Paul's testimony and, and defense of himself, it says that they came with great pomp. They entered the audience hall with military and tri tribunes and the prominent men of the city. So as, as a bit of an illustration, imagine, we don't have to imagine, the, uh, uh, Charles was just um, 
coronated as King of England not long ago. And if you kind of imagine that scene, that's these people. It's, it's, it's a lot of fanfare. The, the actual word translated here for pomp is pageantry. It means pageantry. There's, these people think highly of themselves. They appear to be the only ones, but they think very highly of themselves. Very much like the royal family today. They really have no power. They're figureheads, and, but they, there's a lot of pageantry around them, and they, they, they let you know how important they at least they believe they are. And then if history is accurate, tradition, Paul was not a, uh, Paul was not a, 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 an imposing man. Uh, it is said that he was very short in stature, possibly even balding. So this pageantry they have, imagine a Jewish George Costanza. And I recognize I lost some of you, and some of you completely get this. And for those that don't, can't put those pictures together, I apologize. But those that can, you are welcome. That is the, that's the scene we have here. This is an unimpressive man. This is what stirred up the uh, world of this day. This is the man that must be silenced. It's got to be a very humorous picture. But you don't have to be an opposing man when you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what he looks like. Paul did do these things. So by way of application, again, this is, there's so much history here. We could, we could unpack this uh, quite a bit, but there's three points of application that I'd like to kind of uh, bring out today. One is the traditions of men. God's sovereignty, and finally, Paul's confidence in the gospel. The traditions of men, one of the things that uh, was being, a, the Jews were using to accuse Paul and Jesus before him was this oral tradition they say was passed down from Moses at Sinai. Now, this is not the written word of God. We know that God gave his law to Israel and Moses at Sinai. We have it written in our scriptures. We know what it is. This is something else. This is an oral tradition that only the religious leaders of Israel know about. And it's passed down orally through the generations. That's what they're charging him with. Jesus, and let's turn and look, if you will, with me to Matthew 15. This is what Jesus has to say about this traditions of men. Excuse me. Uh, Matthew 15, beginning in uh, verse 1. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded honor, commanded honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say if anyone tells his father or mother... What you would have gained from from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. There's dangers in these things for us. There are, we see them in our society. What are the doctrines of men? What are the, um, what are these things? There, there, there are many. Like I said before, there's two kinds of people in this world. It's those that are in Christ and those that are of the devil. Those that are still dead in Adam, those that are alive in Christ. There's no middle ground. So God has given us what we should do. So the commandments of men are that which opposes God. And the the tricky thing about this is the Jews had dressed it up a little bit, 
they even question Jesus, why, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? It, it had had a little bit to do with, you know, this is not a bad thing. But Jesus very clearly says, you violate God's law with your traditions. What are some traditions? There's many. One of the things that <clears throat> um, I thought of, and, and it's true today, One of the driving things that drives the Catholic Church is its traditions, its scripture and tradition. They try to hold them together. We have God's word. We are not, Tim has said it many times. I've sat here and heard him say it. When, if God is clear on a subject, we're not entitled to another opinion. We don't get to add to it. We don't get to synchronize, so to speak, the ideas of man and what God has said for us to do. That's the traditions of men. It's very dangerous, and a lot of them are the most dangerous ones are the subtle ones. And then God's sovereignty. I think we see God's sovereignty throughout Paul's life. Um, the change in the leadership went from a maniac to a, as far as uh, humanly speaking, is a fairly noble man that very likely saved in God's providence Paul's life. Another interesting thing is we see throughout Scripture that God often uses these pagan nations and rulers to protect his people from those that would seek to destroy them. We see it throughout the Scripture uh, from the exiled Israelites and Judah, many years prior to this, they are protected by these rulers. This is no different. A, a man like Festus comes in and he is very likely to have protected Paul. We see others uh, concerning Paul as he uh, navigates through, we, uh, God's sovereignty in Paul's life is very clear. He's the, the story of the Philippian jailer. An earthquake sets them free. God has worked sovereignly through his life. Do we look for God working in our lives? It's easy to see his favorable providences and his sovereignty when we have good things happen to us. The challenge is when we have the difficult things happen to us. Do we still, can we say with Paul, that I have counted it joy in want and in plenty? Can we say with him, we're content with whatever God has for us? He's good, he's sovereign, and he knows what's best for us. It's real hard at times, if we're honest, when the difficult things come to see that. But I would argue that those are the times where we are most refined. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul's confidence in the gospel, he's very clear. Romans 1 says, um, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God into salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is what drove Paul, is the truth of the gospel. See, Paul had, you know, they accused him of riots, that he was stirring up controversy. He was upsetting the world. That was some of the accusations leveled against him. He had actually witnessed this a few chapters earlier. It wasn't Paul that started the riots, but rather the gospel working in the city of Ephesus. Back in chapter 19, we see that the gospel so moved through that city, that pagan vile city with the temple of Artemis, Diana, in it, and the trade around it, that was what that city was known for, is so upset by the gospel being uh, spreading through this region that many of them sold what they had and they burned what they had. And it upset the economy of that city so much that they rioted. So Paul has seen these things happen. He's seen people saved, lives changed to the point where he's even seen cities transform. 
Also, another thing, just kind of a bit of a, a bit of an aside. When God tells us the occupation of the disciples as fishermen, they're not accidental. He says later that I will make you fishers of men. That's not accidental. Well, Paul, in the same way, his occupation is a tent maker, very likely because that's what his dad was. That, in that day, that's kind of how it worked. If you were, if your parents or dad was a tent maker, you usually went to be a tent maker. Well, a tent is a dwelling. Paul, the disciples as fishermen are fishers of men, and Paul is a builder of a house. We are God's temple, and as such, we are God's dwelling. I showed this, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I showed this to the students. I think it's, it's an encouraging thing. I think it helps. I'm a visual learner in a lot of ways. So I've got a short video that I'd like to play if they are, are ready to be able to do that. Is, is that, uh, it, this is a good video. I showed the students, it's about a minute and a half, but it's, it's instructive. I thought it was a helpful illustration of what is actually happening because at times we get to, our eyes deceive us. And today, especially with the uh, uh, internet and social media, the world that was once small is now large and everyone has a voice. And those that have a voice that want to manipulate can very easily manipulate. But our eyes deceive us God is doing something in this world. He has promised. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail over it. Gates are a defensive position. They are not off offensive. Hell is not on the offense. Satan is only allowed to do so much. There is one king and that king is Jesus. And we can rest assured that he will continue to build his church. It does not matter what our eyes tell us. And look, I see it. I've told the students when I've had the opportunity to, to teach them, I see the evil in the world. I see it. But I know what God has said he will do. And he said he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We spoke to the students about the micro and the macro when we taught them the parable of the sower and then the parable of the mustard seed. The parable of the sower is the micro. It is the individual level. God gives growth to the individual as the seed of the gospel enters that person and God gives the growth. The mustard seed is what we saw here, is the mi macro when that seed is spread and multiple people, it's the mustard seed and the leaven. That's what God's kingdom is. 
It's slow, but it grows big. You solve the kingdoms of men, rise and fall. That Hebrew speaks of a shaking, that which can be shaken, so that which can't be shaken remains. It's God's kingdom that cannot be shaken. The kingdoms of men will be shaken and will fall. This is the mind that we should have in our world today. God does not need those kingdoms that rose and fall, and that means he doesn't need this United States as it stands today. He just doesn't, and we have to be okay with that. As God's people, we have to be okay with that. I don't want to see this country fall, but I also know that God doesn't need it in the current form that it is. And I take comfort in that, that the true king sits on the throne. It doesn't matter who sits at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It, it doesn't ultimately matter to me. First Peter speaks again of that micro macro idea. He speaks of the believer being born again. God has caused us to be born again. And as believers, we face various trials. And he says that refining fire tests our faith more precious than gold. It refines us when we get trials. And then 2 Peter 3 speaks of this world was once destroyed by water, will be destroyed by fire. But I believe, again, we're speaking spiritually. I believe that is God refining this, his creation. He said in the first Adam, he created it and it was very good. And then the fall happens. And in the first Adam, all have died. But in the second Adam, which is Jesus, we have life in Christ. So I believe God is refining his creation that this is where we will spend eternity. It will be refined according to his word. It doesn't matter what I believe. What does his word tell me? I believe that's what his word tells us very clearly. Um, he did destroy it once with water, but it's still the same rock we live on. It's the same creation. It's the same planet. It looks different, but it's the same one. It'll be the same one as he refines it with fire, like he refines us with trials. These shakings that we see that I think is depicted by the spread of the church across the globe is his refining his creation. And one of my favorite texts, and, I, and, and we will close with this, as I think is one of the more clearer aspects of this, and this is where Paul speaks to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15. You don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians 15. And I'll begin reading in verse 20, 21. For as by a man death, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then it is coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God, the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. That's what he's doing. He's ruling and reigning and he is putting everything into subjection under his feet. This is that psalm that has quoted the most... Um, one of the pastors I enjoy listening to, he often says this is God's, apparently God's favorite Bible verse because this is the one he has quoted the most, that he will put his enemies under his feet as a footstool and he will reign until they're all defeated and that last enemy is death. That is the confidence that I would like to implore you. That's what drove Paul, that's what should drive us is our confidence, not in ourselves, but in what God accomplishes when we share the gospel. Now, what does that mean? That means when we leave here, God has intentionally placed people around us. And I've learned this a little more here lately than, um, than I had previous. For the last 10 years before this, 
you were the people I hung around with the most. And I have had the opportunity to, get, to go back to work this past year. And I'm around the unbelievers more, and that's a good thing. He's placed each person before us, whether we go to school with them, whether we work with them, whether they are in our families. These are people that need to hear the gospel just like we did when God saved us. And we can rest assured and stand strong that God will accomplish his purpose. His word will not return void. He will destroy every stronghold. He will do it. He said he will. And we can rest assured. All we have to do is be faithful and obedient and proclaim the good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do once again, I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for your word. I thank you for its truthfulness. Father, I thank you for the power of your word to save. And Father, I pray that you will continue to work mightily in this world that is desperate to hear the gospel. Help us to whether we see it or not, to see it in your word and to trust it and to know that you are doing it. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.